My favorite line from this last election cycle, Dan Rather was interviewing someone on the street and he said, what's the biggest problem of this election year? Is it, is it ignorance or is it apathy? And the person said, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> I come to a church today that knows something's happening within the body of Christ that terrifies us all and that cares enough to do something about it. I feel safe here. Almost everywhere else my partner says they ought to check their guns and their Bibles at the door. <laughs> we um, have been on the road a long time, for five years now, talking about what it means to be a gay or a lesbian, a bisexual or a transgendered person in the context of universities mainly and you think the university represents the next generation, right? That we're safe because they'll understand the truth and the truth will set them free, ho ho. The fact is that we dodge more rocks on university campuses than anywhere else except the church. Often there are so many Christian students attack me during a speech or shortly before it ends to take the microphone away, I have to be scurried away into a green room somewhere and wait until it's safe to go back to my hotel. Would you believe that? It makes me sad. Uh, Gary and I were on Larry King Live and someone called in and said, this is network television. What do you guys do in bed? And Larry said, that's none of your business and hung up the phone. And I said, no, no, that's his business. Let's tell him. Gary and I have been in the same bed for 13 loving years. We're like everybody else. We sleep in bed. <laughs> and Larry King said, <laughs> and Larry King said, and this is the secret to the whole thing. Once they discover you're as boring as we are, it's all over. <laughs> the fact is, this is a non-issue. The real issue, and your pastor has discovered it and has made it known to you, is that Jesus came to widen the circle to include all the outcasts of the world. And the current church is narrowing the circle to keep everybody out it doesn't like. And you, as a church, are saying, we will go Jesus' way and swallow hard and widen the circle. And so I say to you, from the depth of our hearts, thank you for being the hands and feet of Jesus at a time we don't feel safe. Leonard Bernstein had just finished conducting a great symphony in Lincoln Center. And the biographer overheard two women in the balcony saying during the intermission, have you heard, said one, Leonard's a homosexual. And the other woman, without missing a beat, said, is there anything that man can't do? <laughs> you see, half the world looks at Lenny and says, outcast, sinner, sicko, child abuser, threat to the American family undermines the values and traditions of the nation. And the other woman says, isn't he great? Amen. Thank you for being a church that not only has thought, but has decided to act on behalf of the outcasts. Now, the first time we went to a university, Gary and I, was Texas A&M. Five years ago, we walked into that student body and spoke, and at the end, after the students had, from Campus Crusade and other organizations had mobbed the stage to try to silence me and had screamed scriptures during my text and, and said together in a little chant, abomination, abomination, abomination. Imagine the tension for gay and lesbian people who live in that hostile climate. So we had gone to a reception in a kind of a safe place where the gay and lesbian community and the student leaders had come to welcome us. And when it was about over, a young gay man, a freshman, came to me and said, C -c -c could I see you just for a minute? And I said, sure. What do you want? He said, no, no, could I, could I see you in private? I said, sure. We walked over into a kind of a 
out of the area. And he said, Dr. White, I, I read your book. I saw you on 60 Minutes. I'm hearing you say all over and over the place, I'm gay, I'm proud, and God loves me without reservation. How can you be sure? How can you be so sure that God loves you? When the church tells me over and over again that God doesn't like me, when my teachers tell me, when my principal tells me, when my family despises me and rejects me and tells me, how can you be sure? What a tragic question. What, what would you tell them? <laughs> Every place I go, they come up and say, Dr. White, can I see you? Yeah. You're going to ask me, <laughs> how can you be sure? And they say, how do you know? I said, because everybody asks me. How can you be sure that God loves me? Ask that together out loud. Have you even asked the question before? It's such a tragic question. What would you answer? First I say to them, you know, I would like to say to them, it doesn't help. It's the way I answered the first one at Texas A&M. I said, well, the scientific verdict is in. It is not a choice. The American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Sociological Association, American Psychological Association, the scientific studies all say it's simply another human characteristic. It's like the color of your eyes or the shape of your feet. The psychological, American Psychological Association says it's as natural to be gay or lesbian as it is to be left-handed. So the verdict is in. God created you. He gets tired of heterosexuals and pops out one of us. So, do I say the, the verdict is in? Does that help that kid? Scientific studies doesn't help, don't help. So, so, what do I say? The historic studies? What would the world do without gays and lesbians? I sat down in the uh, narthex between services and wrote out a list of people that I'd like to tell them. Sappho, six centuries before Christ, writing poetry that Hallmark Card uses today, and they don't even know she was a lesbian. Alexander the Great, his love for his general Hephaestion is historic. Look at them. Tchaikovsky, Schubert, Moliere, Amy Lowell, Gertrude Stein, Audre Lorde, Walt Whitman, Tennessee Williams, W.H. Auden, Benjamin Britten, Peter Piers, Edward Albee, Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, Martina Navratilova, Elton John, who wrote this morning's hymn, now Ellen DeGeneres. Would you want a world without Ellen? <laughs> no, it doesn't help to tell the historic stuff either. It just doesn't help. So do I take them through the biblical verses and say, there isn't really, there isn't significant scholarship anymore that says the Bible authors knew anything about homosexual orientation as we know it today. That the, that the passage in Sodom, Sodom, is that, is that about 250,000 men trying to rape? Is that about homosexuality? Not, Billy Graham doesn't even mention sexuality when he preaches on Sodom. The fact is that's a total misunderstanding of that passage. It's about leaving people strangers at the gate. It's about people being outcasts. It's about people demeaning and shaming other folks. The Bible has been used over the centuries to support the flat earth society. They put Galileo and Copernicus under house arrest because they disagreed with what the Bible says, that the earth was the center of the universe. The Bible has been, has been misused to support slavery, apartheid. The Bible can be misused to say anything. So do I show them that the scriptures do not even comment on homosexual orientation, that they don't condemn or support the intimate love and feelings we have for each other? They didn't know about sexual orientation. There's not even a Greek word or a Hebrew word that's used in the scriptures for homosexual. Does that help? No, it doesn't help. You know what helps? You tell them about Jesus and the outcast. Picture it, Texas A&M student. Let me tell you about Jesus. You feel like an outcast. When God chose to redeem the world, he decided to do it through an outcast because God wanted an outcast to redeem outcasts. So he made Jesus first an illegitimate baby, right? Born to an unwed teenage mother 
who couldn't get welfare in my state if she tried. <laughs> right? And he was poor and homeless, born in a barn, surrounded by bleating animals and the smell of urine and manure. And he was adopted by his father and almost immediately knew what it meant to be an illegal alien without a green card in Egypt. Right? Are you following this? <laughs> in Egypt, was he white? Was he Dutch? <laughs> no, he was a person of color. Jesus was a person of color. Say it. He'd feel funny in this place, even this place. He was like a lot of lesbians I know, headstrong and disobedient, <laughs> um, arguing with the male elders and more power to him. And he was single, a bachelor, never had any kids, really bad. You talk about being an outcast. In fact, he took his mother to the bachelor party where they first had a miracle out of Jesus and he changed the water into wine. The, the irony, he, he, he had some weird disciples really weird disciples. None of them was religious. And all of them were scary. They, and who he hung out with completely was scary, like he hung out with publicans and sinners. Now, I said publicans. <laughs> publicans were Jews who collaborated with the Romans to take taxes from their own people. Publicans. Republicans are people like all of us who have some very difficult choices to make right now. He, he had a special disciple that the disciple himself in the book of John says, John, the disciple that Jesus loved. And if you read the picture, it says in the scriptures that after dinner, that disciple had a habit of laying his head on Jesus' chest while Jesus taught. He just lay there and looked up into his eyes. Now, come on, folks. Can you see Pat Robertson with Ralph Reed lying in his lap? <laughs> And he made the radical right of his day mad every time he spoke. Who did Jesus come down on the most? The religious. They said, you eat food that is impure. And he said, it's not what goes into your mouth, but what comes out of it that defiles one. They said, you don't keep the traditions of the elders. And he said, for the sake of your traditions, you've rendered useless and powerless the word of God. They said, you don't obey God. And he said, you honor God with your lips, but your hearts are far from God. The church was meant to be a house of prayer for the outcast. And it was turned into a money-making enterprise. And Jesus looked at those who had turned it into a money-breaking enterprise and said, get out of here, thieves. Welcome into the church the outcast. Texas A&M student watch Jesus in his life. Listen to Jesus in his actions. Hear Jesus' words. Feel Jesus' arms around you. The second miracle was a leper. Outcast. You know, if I'm come to heal the outcast, why don't I start with the worst? They had to ring a bell and say, unclean, unclean. No one could get near them, no one could touch them. They were filth. So here comes a leper, and Jesus has just started with his little group of disciples, and they're going down the road, and here comes a leper. And the disciples see them and, of course, run for the cactus. And the leper comes, and the leper is saying, don't touch me, and the disciples are saying, don't touch me, and the church is saying, if you touch him, you're out. What does Jesus do? He walks right up to the leper and takes him in his arms and says, outcast, God loves you. Be clean. And the leper lifted his hands to heaven and said, I get it. What was more important, being healthy or being touched? I think it was when he felt the arms of another human being around him for the first time in a long time. Jesus did something to that outcast that that outcast will never feel the same again. What was the second miracle? You know, the worst kind of outcast in those days was to be a woman. That woman, outcast, also had a flow of blood, which made her double outcast. 
Anything she touched, including a pot or a pan, had to be taken to the temple to be cleansed. Okay? She wants to be healed, but she can't get near the patriarchy, the sexist males who run the church. So she says, I'll think, I'll sneak through the crowd and just touch his garment. And she does. And at that moment, Jesus whirls around and says, who touched me? How would you feel if you were that woman? Ah! I'm dead. And instead, what does she find? She says, Jesus says, come here. And he puts his arm around her and he says, men, listen. I haven't found faith like this in all of Israel. And he says to her, be well. Can you feel, Texas A&M student, the hands of Jesus on your face saying it's okay? You're not an outcast anymore. Can you feel that, gay and lesbian people? Jesus saying, I'm God and I'm here to tell you they're all wrong. The Samaritan woman, five divorces, outcast. She's the only person in the history of New Testament literature to whom Jesus said, I am Messiah. He trusted the secret of his lifetime with that outcast Samaritan, wrong nation, outcast divorce, five husbands, outcast woman, outcast, living with another man with whom she wasn't married, adulterer, outcast. He sat on a well and talked to her and talked to her and her disciple said, his disciple said what? What in the world are you doing with that woman? And he said, we're having a theological discussion. <laughs> Join in and get a clue or go away. <laughs> all through his life, Jesus reached out to the outcast, my favorite story of all. I read a little into it, but forgive me. You'll have to decide when you read the Greek whether it's true or not, okay? That's the rules here, right? A young centurion from Rome is an outcast in Israel because he's the occupying force, right? If you read the literature of Rome, you know that a lot of these centurions were gay men. <laughs> and they often carried their partners with them in the retinue, often. It's very common. Now, picture this. The centurion has a servant home sick on his bed. He wants Jesus. He's heard that Israel has a healer, and he wants Jesus to heal this servant. But he can't get near Jesus because that's not the rules, and so he shouts out across the crowd, excuse me. I have a servant, now read the Greek. The word for servant in Greek is invariably doulos. In this text, it's pais. It means my special friend, my, it can mean my beloved. Is at home on our bed. Read it. And tell me how you feel about that moment. Jesus said, good, now that Texas Nam student can really see how I feel. So he says, yes, I'd love to come to your home, centurion, and I'd love to heal your <coughs> servant. And the centurion says, thinking about all the pictures he'd have to turn around. <laughs> Why don't you just heal him long distance? <laughs> and Jesus says, okay, I'll do that, be healed. And from that day, that centurion was reunited with the one he loved. Outcast, Texas A&M student, hear this. Jesus is God at work in the world, reaching out to everyone who feels like an outcast. Brothers and sisters in this church, you have joined in as Jesus' arms to reach out to us. Do you know how happy that makes God feel? And when you reach your arms of love out simply to say you're welcome here, you are being Jesus in this town and in this place. The same day the newspaper announced my coming to your city, I wonder if you noticed the story in that paper on the same page of another young gay man who had killed himself, a teenager. One out of three teenagers in this country who kills him or herself is a gay or lesbian kid who is so overwhelmed by the toxic rhetoric, is so terrified by what the response to his life is going to be, he lies down and dies. Jesus came 
to reach out to the outcast and say, Outcast, I love you. I created you. I want you to be safe. We were in New Orleans. I was about to speak to a banquet. People began to whisper. I said, what's wrong? And they said, with tears in their eyes, these gay and lesbian leaders, another high school senior honor student has just killed himself. And I said, tell me the story. And he said, they came after being told by his parents that they, he, he was not acceptable, and being told by his priest that he was a sinner and that he was sick. He went to a funeral home in downtown New Orleans, spread a plastic sheet, and shot himself to death with a shotgun after leaving a note that said, I don't want to be any more trouble to anybody else. Suicide is rampant amongst us. You don't know how many we have to bury because they've heard so many times that God doesn't love them. Texas A&M student, please, before you pull the trigger, look deep into the eyes of Jesus and hear God say, I have come to widen the circle and to bring in the outcasts. You are the people of God and you will transform the world. Amen.